Welcome to QTB Legends, where legends of the gaming industry come to tell their story. I am Nick, and I am joined by the one and only QTB's Brad. How is it going, man? Nick, I am very excited for today. I think we've got something truly special for our listeners. Something in this QTB Legends kickoff, we've got such a special guest that launched this uh, this new opportunity for Quit the Build, and, and I'm really excited to get this interview started today. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about who we got here, because this is uh, this is quite, like you said, quite the way to get things started. Well, we are very honored and excited to be kicking off the Quit the Build legends with none other than Don Traeger, uh, the co-founder of EA Sports, uh, most known also for his work uh, at uh, Electronic Arts with EA Sports. He started his career with Atari Games. He really distinguished himself by producing EA's first internally developed hit, Skate or Die. Uh, but he's had such a long stay in the gaming industry. You know, he, he at some point, he's also had his new technology startup, his own game development studio, DT Productions, and uh, really just uh, over the course of these last 30 years had such a, a tremendous impact on the gaming industry. So we're really excited to have Don here today to share a little bit about his, his career and, and some really, I think, untold secrets and anecdotes of his time uh, in the gaming industry. So welcome, Don. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. I, l- I love your guys' show. In fact, last week you got me into Shovel Knight. So I thank oh. you for that. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoy Fantastic. it. It's, it's, quite, it's quite the title, quite the throwback, right? Yeah, it is pretty awesome. I love some of those old retro throwback games. Just just for our listeners, we're going to get a chance to really talk to Don over the course of uh, a, a while here and cover a wide range of topics in his career, uh, You know, starting from his time at Atari, uh, even talking about starting his own game development uh, studio. But today we're going to focus on the big one. The, the creation and st- founding of EA Sports. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Don, well, let's dive right in. I, I know we briefly covered that in your in- yeah. intro as a, one of the co-founders of EA Sports, uh, and you've had such a storied and impactful career in gaming. Why don't you tell us a bit how you got your start at EA and, and, and what got you uh, there to start, you know, what led to EA Sports? Yeah, so uh, I came from L.A. I had a graduate degree from USC in uh, MBA market research. You know, around that time, uh, the arcade game craze really started uh, getting interesting. And I I really got fascinated with it. And uh, so I ended up at Atari uh, in the marketing department in the arcade division. Worked on a lot of really cool arcade games. Uh, Paperboy, I was working on 720. Uh, Mark Cerny, who who I think designed the uh, PlayStation 5 for Sony, uh, was a young engineer there, and he did a couple games. One was called Major Havoc, and another one was called Marble Madness. Okay, so uh, it was Marble Madness that really set the uh, set the sails for my career at EA. Uh, a couple guys at EA, which was newly formed, were in love with Marble Madness and wanted to try to license it for this new computer that was coming out called the Commodore Amiga. I had never heard of Electronic Arts. We were kind of the kings at Atari at the time, the coin-op division. Our, our technology and our graphics and everything was really, we were kind of like uh, fighter pilots compared to the, to the rest of the company. But Trippin, a guy that uh, became my boss and uh, still a friend today, Stuart Bond, sent me a couple of early EA games. One was Dr. J versus Larry Bird. And the other one, uh, actually a couple more, there was Mule and I think Seven Cities of Gold. So we looked at them and we're all, I, I grabbed a bunch of guys and we were looking at them. And we were kind of laughing because the, the uh, graphics were so crude and it was computer software and we hadn't even really paid, been paying attention to computers. You know, Atari, the, the game machine Atari was, was in the midst of crashing and uh, in that void there were, there was computer game software, but it really wasn't that well known and we didn't pay much attention to it. But there was something about Dr. J versus Larry Bird, even even in its crude graphic form, that really reached out to me. I tell Brad it's like it grabbed my soul and I and I couldn't I couldn't forget it. Uh, as we negotiated the licensing deal for Marvel Mad- Madness, we did uh, license it to EA uh, for the Amiga. They kept trying to recruit me to come to EA. I was in one of my lunch lunches with Trip, who was uh, you know, in the young days, he was a real visionary guy. And uh, 
it's funny to think about a time when there weren't computers in every house or the uh, notion of that was, was surprising. But he said, you know, come to EA Don, someday there'll be a computer in every house. And I'm like, no, really? What? <laughs> and I remember going home that night and talking to my wife about it because leaving Atari was kind of a traumatic event for me. I really loved it and what we were doing in the arcades. Uh, and we talked about it and she was like, yeah, I bet he's right. You know? So, uh, with, with the vision of a computer, uh, in every home, I made the move to, to EA and joined the marketing group. And my first, my first project to market was, uh, Marble Madness on the Amiga. So, uh, that's, that's how I, I ended up at EA in the marketing department. I got a question for you. You mentioned computers. You talked about that notion of a you know, Trip saying there could be a computer in every home. You know, we, we think about how maybe accurate that statement was, right? You know, today computers are a mainstay in our world. I mean, a lot of us are working remotely right now on our computers, being able to still maintain, uh, you know, our jobs and 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 maintain businesses. Uh, and many of our listeners, you know, have probably built their own high powerful gaming computers at home. Oh yeah. You know, so. You know, what? what's your viewpoint of how that's transcended since those early days of, of working and in, in designing games on the Amiga or, you know, the Macintosh or even the IBM PCS? Like, what's your viewpoint on how that's that's maybe changed the industry and even game development? Oh, it's 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 changed radically. But, you know, the, the in that interim period after the Atari crash and. Nintendo, the Nintendo Entertainment System really wasn't going. It may, might have been in Japan, but there was only computer software and people didn't know about it. Nobody had ever heard of electronic arts. Like my parents wondered what the hell I was doing. I had my MBA from SC and I was, you know, up doing computer games and my, my friends, you know, everybody was like, I'm smoking pot. What's going on with this? Dude? <laughs> Nobody had heard of it. It was really uh, an unknown thing. And that that's just, it's so foreign now. In, in those early days, I just remember being worried. You know, we never knew if what we were doing was going to last. Like, we didn't know that it was going to be a business like the movies or music. Uh, I was always worried that it was going to be toy-like, like the Atari was, and, you know, have a have a Christmas or two, and then go away. So there was... In all the excitement about what we were doing and, and developing things, there was always some concern in the back of my mind. Like, is this real? Is this going to keep going? You know, you just didn't know. We were, we were really just kind of pioneering this thing. You know, kind of with that framework, it's funny to look back at those old hardwares and, you know, imagine. Because we weren't all like, someday this is going to look really good. I mean, we talked about that. I remember having an idea because uh, my parents, who, who I mentioned, were like wondering what the hell I was doing up up in the Bay Area with this game game stuff. I used to tell my friends, you know, someday, because I was always doing sports games, I'm going to have this thing so my dad can't tell if it's a real game on TV or a video game. We used to just kind of say that for fun. Well, now I walk by a screen and I really can't tell sometimes, <laughs> especially on the, you know, the, the newest generation of hardware. So it's funny to look back at those uh, old hardwares. You know, we would do the PC or the Tandy and we like the Tandy because I, I, as I recall, they had four different color palettes of four colors versus two. So like you we're doing Jordan and Bird and you had to pick your color palettes uh you know one was like red black white oh and that worked for Jordan okay and then for for the uh for the Celtics colors it's like we had this ugly looking cyan and a white you know so you just had such limited stuff to work with uh that it made it a challenge but that's all we had so that's that's what we did you know the soundtracks i mean it just carries on through that it was really difficult so in some of these early five on five games especially uh they just weren't done because the technology couldn't handle it in some sense it made things easy in some sense it made things hard so for example uh, a precursor 
to EASN sports game that we did for the C64 was called Power Play Hockey. And it was an okay game. You know, it wasn't great. It wasn't certainly not as good as the Genesis games that were to come out a couple years later. But Power Play Hockey, we were trying to move, you know, 10 skaters around uh, the rink. And it was really technically a challenge at that time. So we kind of came up with a system where we uh, we kept skaters in zones so we wouldn't clog up the screen with too many sprites. And it worked pretty well. It was pretty fun. It ended up being a lot of passing, which is kind of cool. You know, you'd pass from zone to zone. But it was almost like a computer version of those twist stick hockey games, you know, like checks in the arcade or the ones I used to have at home. Because you had to keep your skaters in in kind of zones like that. And so that was some of the some of the challenges that you just didn't have to worry about later on. You know, not just the the five on five sports games, Don, but also, you know, your work with just pioneering entire sports that hadn't been put into game form before, I think have to be talked about because yeah. You know, Skate or Die, a lot of people remember that game and, and just the the incredible way it had the digitized voices and just that, you know, that rad attitude that uh, yeah. a lot of games at the time had. But m- many people don't know that the very first skateboarding game ever made was actually 720 for the Atari, which you had a hand in, right? Right, right. I mean, do you ever look at, like, the Tony Hawk games and be like, yeah, I did it first? No, I, well, I don't think that. I think, man, this Tony Hawk game is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good, and I was pretty impressed with it. But, yeah, uh, we were happy. The, the 720 game was awesome for its day. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but in my way of thinking, it wasn't completely open world, but it was really moving in that direction, and it didn't have, like, a lot of a lot of arcade games had endings or uh, would just kind of keep playing ad nauseum. But uh, Skate or Die, kind of an offshoot of sports stuff, we uh, – uh, I was moving over uh, to being a producer from marketing and I was going to start hiring my own uh, projects and teams. And there was a series of games from Epic's uh, uh, something games. So there was summer games, winter games, world games, California games, and they were all pretty awesome. I guess, I guess you'd say they were all kind of variants originally of that Konami track and field game where there was different events and you'd, You'd have different controls uh, to control different events. And I love those games uh, things. And one of my uh, associates at EA happened to be friends with the three guys at Epics that were responsible for those games. So uh, through his uh, recruiting, we got him to come to EA. And then they became my teammates for many years. And we worked on uh, Skate or Die together we, we we can all agree that you know skate or die came out with such wide a critical acclaim and great success right and i right. wonder you know I, I think at the time when we've been talking leading up to this interview you mentioned you know this was ea's first internal development game right and i think you really in some ways were pushing ea to move towards that internal development versus other strategies right can you talk a little yeah. bit about the the difference between having that internal development team versus mm-hmm you know, outside contractors or yeah. what that's, how, how does that change the development of a game? So it, it's really interesting. So my, you know, my background was at Atari. Everything was internally developed. Uh, all the hardware, every project had its own new hardware design, sound, everything came from the team. The team. So uh, I was really used to that close interaction daily with the game. You could come into the lab, uh, bounce ideas off, you know, do things and just see it develop every day to me was really important. So when I came to EA and I was first going to start producing, I realized, oh man, it's not the same. You do outside deals with outside contractors, which is fine. That's cool. But uh, you only see what they wanted you to see. They could kind of control things. You might, you might see a build Every month, it kind of depends on how the milestones were uh, set up in the contract. And I just found it uh, pretty limiting. So uh, at the time when I was going to start, I was really pushing to do internal, uh, internally developed games. So we had kind of more control. But at the same time, there were some people uh, who had also come kind of during the Amiga time 
and they also agreed more more from a, a an engine and technology basis. So one of the battles became uh, owning technology and engines, so you didn't have to keep uh, licensing things, and that became a big part of moving internal. Um, you know, the other thing that I didn't mention before that I think is underrated, but shouldn't be neglected. Uh, there was a period of time before we were doing carts and before I started Skate or Die, where Trip went over to England, there was a lot of action and arcade type products coming out of England uh, in the mid 80s for Commodore. And what they had was the Z80 and um, some some pretty good games, but also a lot of kind of, you know, budget wear type stuff. But anyway, he went over there and surveyed the scene. And the one thing he found was this incredible uh, audio guy, and his name was Rob Hubbard. And he had been doing all these crazy soundtracks on whatever uh, SID chip or whatever it was that uh, they had to work with. And so Tripp was over there and had the foresight to um, recruit him. And, and you know, he was in London and was dying to come to San Francisco in the 80s. So he came over and that made a big difference because Rob, Rob did all the sound of the, the soundtracks and the music in those early days for all my games, Skate or Die and Lakers Celtics and all that stuff. So uh, I always like to throw a bone in for him, but that was another benefit that we got, you know, from owning the technology internal. We had, now we had all these experts in different fields and all these things uh, contributing to our own stuff. And it made, it made a big difference. So it went from, you know, no internal development and trip kind of being skeptical about it to skater die was this big hit. And then all of a sudden it was like, boom, we just started hiring. And, uh, you know, we always did maintain uh, some out, outside development, but a lot of the stuff uh, became internal. And what was interesting is what I started doing was kind of a hybrid. So uh, like for Lakers Celtics, I had a really good friend, Robert Weatherby from Atari, who was just, you know, genius uh, kind of R&D programmer. Uh, but he didn't have any artists or any of that. So nor in a normal condition, I wouldn't have been able to, to sign him uh, to help make a game because he didn't have a studio. You know, they'd go, well, what, what, are, you, what are you hiring? Uh, but since I had my own internal staff of artists and Michael Kasaka was, you know, managing a bunch of internal artists, we had, we had sound development internally now. So I could do these hybrid projects where I would hire, you know, an engineering team from the outside and combine them with our art and sound. And that was pretty cool because uh, we were still doing some outside stuff, but I still had a lot of control and, and visibility on a daily basis because we were doing a lot of the work too. And, it, and it, I think it made for a more cooperative, uh, you know, kind of non-adversarial way to develop, which is, what I learned from Atari, that's how they were. Well, I, I, I really appreciate you giving us that insight because I think right now what we're seeing, especially in a lot of the shows, that the recent episodes we've recorded, is we're seeing this interesting dynamic in the gaming industry right now where these developers are being bought up. You're seeing these massive acquisitions. And so, you know, it's a really interesting point to see how back then it was still such a, a predominant topic and you kind of led the way at EA to shift from outside, you know, development to internal development. So yeah. I still think it resonates today in, in today's, you know, industry. Right. So. Yeah, it does for sure. Just uh, <laughs> 20 times more the valuations. <laughs> right. <laughs> no kidding. right. <laughs> well, well, before we get into the, the EA sports juggernaut that we're yeah. going to get into, yeah. I just wanted to kind of ask, you know, it seems like you've been able to hold different positions with different responsibilities. You talked about moving, from, you know, you know, kind of product mar marketing to production. Yeah. What do you think you learned in product marketing that really helped you be more successful when you moved into production and leading oh. your own projects and running your teams? Yeah, so interesting. So um, when I was at SC in graduate school, my interest was in film marketing. That's what I wanted to do. LA is a good place for that. Video games got in the way. But um <laughs> so what I, what I what I focused on in my graduate school, uh, we called uh, well, it, you could kind of create your own major. And my, uh, so I did uh, product development, market research. So 
I was specializing. And at the time I was working at uh, Yamaha Motors in their market research group, which was really a good background because Yamaha is this huge Japanese company, motorcycles, high-end music equipment, um, audio chips, you know, musical instruments like, uh, you know, so it's this amazing company. Uh, and to be successful in the U.S. markets, they re- really relied on marketing and market research. So uh, I had a real strong uh, background in, in market research. And when I moved to Atari, uh, that's what I did for the development teams. I did focus groups and field tests. I was putting you know, games out on test and just sitting in the arcades watching kids play for weekends. Some people called it intuition. Well, Traeger has really good intuition. And yeah, maybe so. But I really think it was spending, uh, you know, 40 hour weekends in the arcades down in uh, Sunnyvale, uh, yeah. watching kids play at golf land and um, learning a ton. So uh, by the time uh, I really got in my groove at Atari, I was really helping the development teams a lot. In fact, um, for Paperboy, uh, I had done so much work that I was the first marketing guy at Atari that the developers put in their bonus bonus pool, their team bonus pool. Nice. Uh, so that was that was pretty cool. I also like to say about Paperboy because some people think this is cooler than uh, starting EA Sports. Uh, that that's my digitized voice in the arcade game. So that's rad. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So early on, uh, very rare. Uh, there might have been some digitized game before, but it was one of the early games to have digitized voice. And they were using a Yamaha speech chip, which was this new chip that was really cool. We were going to do uh, uh, a script for the paper boy for things to say. And uh, a lot of people wanted to be the paper boy. We were doing, uh, they, they were doing t- uh, auditions, you know, t- tape auditions. And then they were digitizing the voice and seeing how it played on the, on the chip. I go in there and do some recordings. And, you know, because I kind of have this high-pitched, scratchy voice. When it digitized and was replayed, I was the only voice that sounded like a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I got the part, and that was pretty fun. So I, I had, uh, you know, we had come up with all this stuff and then had to pass the review board, So uh, the internal Atari review board. So as an example of one line that didn't make it was, uh, in Paperboy, you pass various characters along the way. And one of them is a wino and this wino's walking down the street. And so when I drove by, I said, Hey dad. And, uh, uh, that, that got cut. <laughs> that got cut. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It became, <laughs> hey, I know that dude. <laughs> hey, I know that dude. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so there's a lot, there was a lot of funny stories, uh, Oh man, I, w- I wish we could find that recording, the, the deep cuts of Paperboy, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Here's one. So years later, I'm at, a, I'm at a CES show. They had some new version of Paperboy. I think it was for the N64 and it was called like Paperboy 3D or something like that. So I go to the show, I go to the booth and I'm the only one at the Paperboy stand and I start playing the game. And, uh, so the guy, the the young guy that was working the booth for Bally came up behind me and said, oh, sir, are you familiar with Paperboy? And I turned around and looked at him. I said, young man, I am Paperboy. And I walked away. <laughs> mic drop. <laughs> yeah, it was a mic drop. He was like, Whoa. Amazing. <laughs> That's, a, that's well, incredible. Well, I went back to our booth and I was telling everybody and there, we were just howling. It was so funny. Well, Don, really, uh, th- what a great anecdote about. So anyone, all our listeners out there, if you played Paperboy, then you you know Don, you know his voice. He's there. So uh, right. one quick question I have. I know, you know, kind of looking at, you know, your beginnings at EA and kind yeah. of maybe precipice, you know, the precipice to going into EA Sports. Mm-hmm. I know early on there was this debate about whether – you wanted to really focus just solely on computers or stay, you know, go into the cartridge business. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about, you know, that, that, that struggle internally of where the strat, the business strategy lied on, on game development? Yeah, that was, that was a real ongoing uh, agitation and issue for uh, 
I'd say there was a small group of, uh, of uh, revolutionaries that wanted to move to carts. And uh, Trip was just uh, holding on to the idea that um, it wasn't a good idea, that the, the, the licensing agreements were too egregious and, you know, they were going to be a flash in the pan. And uh, we had done fine with computer software, but it's like a massive hit was 100,000 units. You know, if I, if I did a game that could get 100,000 units, I, I would get a, a, a platinum plaque. You know, the company would do it. So I have all these plaques that are like 100,000 units, which is like nothing in the cart world. So there was some pressure to, to move to cartridges uh, and it just kept building as the Nintendo kept getting more popular. So uh, personally, for me, the agitation became because I was the one guy at, at EA that was really focused on uh, action sports, you know, the teenage male market mostly, which I knew from the arcade business. Most of my titles were getting licensed away and doing big numbers on the NES that I couldn't achieve in the original form on computer. So I was starting to get uh, kind of antsy about it. Uh, Jordan Bird was big, like on every console and uh, cartridge format that was known. Uh, Skater Die was a was a big number one hit for Konami's Ultra. Uh, Kings of the Beach, which was a which is kind of an action arcadey game, we did. I did another really funny takeoff on the game stuff with a with a funny great artist named Greg Johnson. It was called Caveman Olympics. And it imagined that uh, the Olympic events started with, in the Neanderthal days. So there's all these goofy, uh, you know, the the uh, sprint races were started by uh, trying to outrun a saber-toothed tiger. You know, crazy stuff like that. And that even got licensed away and did pretty big numbers. Uh, and that was by Data East. So I was getting real agitated about licensing what I called all my all my family jewels away to the biggest format and we weren't taking advantage of it. So uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, there was also additional pressure, uh, I think from the board around the time that we started getting wind of the fourth generation of consoles, you know, the, the Super NES and the Sega right. consoles. And unfortunately, uh, we missed the boat on NES, but we were able to license a bunch of the stuff. So I still had pretty big presence. And then the other thing that did, I knew from our licensing success that we could do this, you know, that um, I, I, I had a lot of confidence that once we moved to carts, we were going to be successful because we had already had a degree of success by the licenses we did. Well, I, I can't help but show, see, we, we just showed on the screen for, for, for those who could see uh, the Jordan versus bird, uh, uh, you know, cover here. And it's hard for me not to pass up on the opportunity here. You can talk about moving the carts in the beginning of, of EA Sports, really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it can't help but notice that maybe working with Michael Jordan in the NBA and these other you know leagues uh, really helped kind of what solidify the creation of EA Sports, right? So can you talk about kind of how you got the NBA or some of the other leagues and how you got to Jordan? Like, I mean, like what, yeah. what was that experience like? One of the ideas, even going back to Dr. J and Larry Bird and certainly carried through with Madden and Earl Weaver is we were pretty proud about the fact that we weren't just doing a license and sticking uh, somebody's name and picture on the cover that we were actually trying to build their perspective into the game. It started simply uh, with these one-on-one -on -one type games that, that allowed us to kind of build this uh, this reality into it using two people versus a whole team. Uh, you know, Dr. J, Larry Bird. Then um, uh, I mentioned Kings of the Beach, where we signed two, uh, uh, two of the current SAN, uh, vo pro volleyball SAN stars, Sinjin Stokeless and Randy Smith. And they were surprised because when we licensed them, and this is all pre-ASN, pre uh, I think Kings of the Beach was pre-Jordan Bird, but it, all around the same time. And when we had them up for the day, there was a big uh, pro beach tour in uh, Santa Cruz. So we we took an afternoon to meet with them at Don Transis, par um, my marketing partner's uh, parents' house in Aptos Beach down near Santa Cruz. And they were surprised 
the degree to which we are asking for stats and different uh, different shot uh, making stuff from different points of the, you know they just thought they were signing their name and instead we were really trying to build their build their experience into the game that that carried on with uh, with Jordan versus Bird early and crudely what we did with Jordan Bird is we just basically took the took a half court and divided it into uh, a grid a, like a sixteen by sixteen grid. And we put, we had them each, uh, you know, put their put their shooting percentage, shoot, put their shooting percentage in each square of the grid. And it was interesting because Bird was just a massive practice guy. He would he would shot thousands and thousands of shots from every part of the court. He could tell you on the old uh, parquet court in Boston Garden, he knew his shots from different pegs in the floor. You know, he was just meticulous that way. So when he looked at the 16 by 16 grid, he he pretty easily could put in his shooting percentage from each spot. And it was interesting. Sometimes it would be like 96. Sometimes it would be like 72. So uh, he was very precise. And then with, with Michael Jordan, who I'd say is, was more of a natural athlete, you know, flying dunker type guy, he wasn't as precise, you know, he could put estimates, but the funny thing is, is um, when we had this meeting where we went over shot percentages, Jordan came in, Jordan came in second. So we had still had the board up with bird <laughs> stats Bird's board, numbers. <laughs> and so Jordan went up to the board and said, damn, he likes that shot. I'm going to remember that. Thanks a lot. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, but you know, so we were really trying to build uh, that reality in and it and it was in those days it was easier uh, with smaller teams you know be, uh, of guys one on one was perfect so then when we started talking about doing an NBA game which we were the first to license the full NBA uh, I really remember you know carrying that through okay we've done this with Jordan and Bird now we got to do it for five on five and that was really uh, how we thought about it. How do we build these guys? So each guy got his own special move and we could do the heads and as crude as it was, it was still really cool for its day. Uh, but it really all started with that, that early work with the one-on-one guys and trying to figure out how to make it more real than just the license name. Yeah. I was gonna say for our listeners up here right now, we've got a, a really amazing personal photo here with Don literally having Michael Jordan test the the game here. And and so I wanted to ask you, Don, you know, what, what was that experience like, you know, to be able to present Michael Jordan in person with a demo or a, a, an iteration of the game that's going to be coming out and seeing him play, play himself or, and, and have commentary on that experience. Oh, you look nervous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always a bit, always a bit nervous going in, but uh, you know, especially in the early days, he was very easy going. As as things went crazy for him in his life, then he had to become, uh, you know, change a little bit. You know, the funny thing is with all these guys, even going way back to to, to the computer days. So Jordan was into computer, into computers and games before the console stuff. You know, he signed up with us for PC and C64 and all, because he was into it. And most of these athletes, they were, uh, and and their agents too, they were really into the, uh, into the technology stuff. So um, it was always kind of cool actually to go out there because we knew they were always going to like what we were doing and they just were in love with the technology. So when we finally started doing our own carts, SNES, uh, I started doing stuff for the Super Nintendo and they also were doing uh, around the same time, maybe a little bit before the SNES, they started doing Game Boy. So we got a license for Game Boy and SNES. And of course we put Jordan and Bird on there and, you know, that was showing them the Game Boy uh, Jordan Bird probably didn't look great, but to them it was cool. You know, he thought a four color pixel pixely guy on a, on a candy was cool. So you know, the Google <laughs> was better than that. And then the Sega Genesis, uh, even better than that. Well, uh, you ca- talk about that Jordan being interested in, in computers and, and gaming and, and, and that technology. I feel like that's such a counter to what we were talking about when you were seeking out these contracts with these leagues, right? Tell me about when you went to pitch this, pitch this five on five game or, or this to the NBA and like, and, and what the, did they even know what they were looking at? Yeah. Like, it- 
it's it really interesting. So, and it wasn't just the NBA, like I said before, the real world out there just didn't know computer games, you know, not many people and uh, nobody had ever heard of EA. So uh, when, you know, when I compare it to the later days when I could call up and say, Hey, I'm, I'm from EA and they'd go, Oh, uh, let's talk. You know, you'd, they'd go, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so it was a battle getting your foot in the door. They just didn't really, uh, a lot of these leagues, you know, the PGA was, was similar, although there had been so much noise around like golf simulations that I think there was a little more awareness, but uh, yeah, like when we first pitched the NBA on doing a team basketball game, like I said, nobody had ever done one before. They had no idea the licensing people and the licensing group at the NBA was set up around uh, mostly clothing licensing. You know, that's what they knew. Hats, shirts, sweatshirts, uh, shoes. You know, when we first finally did the license, uh, we were thrown in with the with the woman that ran uh, ran the clothing license stuff. You know, they didn't have a they didn't have a video game technology division yet. Um, so we were showing them this little, cool little demo that we had that was pretty unusual for its time. Robert Weatherby had uh, like it sounds trite now, but uh, three different body types: short, medium, and tall. <laughs> We could put the individual heads on guys. So like Kareem had a little bald head with goggles. Worthy had hair and goggles. Uh, you know, you could do just enough with the pixels to kind of tell who it was. And then the other thing he did was each guy had a special move. And for the for the um, demo, when you'd get into their kind of trigger zone, you could do the special move. So we had Kareem with the sky hook. Uh, James Worthy did like a uh, flying tomahawk dunk. You know, we probably had a couple other uh, characters that were under control in this demo. Looked really cool. Um, again, Robert Weatherby did the engineering and, and my pal Michael Kasaka did the graphics. So it was, we were doing this kind of hybrid style outside and inside. So we get to the uh, NBA and we set up our demo and they're looking at it going, wow. What is that? Is it a videotape? They kept saying it is a videotape. They didn't understand. Wow. And finally one guy noticed that I was controlling. He's like, well, wait a minute. Are you controlling that? I'd say they were pretty gobsmacked, but it, it wasn't like on their fault. They they didn't know just like most people didn't know what was going on. You know, my like I said, my parents didn't know what was going on either. They're like, what are you guys doing? So uh funny in that in that meeting, uh my partner Don Transith. Uh, from marketing, as we were walking to the NBA office, we noticed that there was an Egghead software store just a few blocks from their office on Fifth Avenue. And you guys probably don't know Egghead software, but like I said, it was like the GameStop for computer software. You know, you'd walk in, it was all computer software. There was packaging and things. And if you didn't know any better, because remember, a lot of people still didn't have computers at home. A lot of people didn't. Did, Usually the only time that you interacted with a computer was probably at work doing doing uh, emails or something because they were, they seemed like they dug it, but they didn't really understand. Uh, me and Tranny decided for lunchtime, we'd take all the guys we were meeting with down to the software, Egghead software store just to show them. So we, you know, I said, Hey, you know, there's a, st a software store not too far. You want to go take a look? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So we all, we all uh, left the office, walked down the street, went into Egghead, and they were like blown away. You know, there were games and different products and things they just hadn't hadn't been aware of. So I think, uh, you know, we ended up getting the deal, which was a great relief uh, because I, I felt to make the EASN brand really work, we needed all the leagues. Uh, it would be Mickey Mouse if we were missing the NBA. Um, and they... Uh, so when they agreed agreed to the deal, I really think it was as much about, uh, you know, me and uh, Transus and my passion for what we were doing, as well as just kind of discovering the um, the whole field of computer software. So luckily with our deals, um, EA had a, had a really smart system, I think, in this way. So I was free to uh, 
go out and meet people, try to get deals going, uh, roughly estimate what the financial deal would be. But I didn't have to be the one uh, to be the hard uh, financial negotiator. We had uh, my boss, Stuart Bond, uh, who was really good at that kind of stuff. So I would kind of reel him in and then let uh, Stuart and the NBA kind of hammer out uh, the final deal. But the smart thing is, is uh, you know, they were all, always multi-year deals. And we had, uh, even though we weren't doing video games, we made, uh, still, we made sure we had the rights for computer software and video games. And uh, that, was a, that was a big one. Like, you know, for Jordan, he was really into the technology. And his agent was a big-time agent, David Falk. He was really into technology too. They're hot. So they always loved it uh, when they came to visit or we came to visit them because they just dug what we were doing. And that that was that's pretty much true to this day with the athletes. You know, they love this stuff and their agents love this stuff and they all want to they all want to be in it and do it and work on it. And this was true, you know, even back in those in those days. Uh, but for the Jordan deal, it was pretty funny because I think psychologically trip wasn't real happy with the idea of replacing dr j even though he'd retired you know that was his baby and uh you know now we got uh michael jordan coming in to replace dr j who was a pretty awesome legend in his own right you know so he was kind of debating the finances of it all we ended up getting jordan for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and six years which wow. back then was a good deal <laughs> great <laughs> deal it's incredible he, he got some royalties out of it too but uh you know it was an amazing deal and then and then uh, uh well can i just say as a sidebar i'm jealous like it'd be great for me just to meet michael jordan let alone <laughs> take one photo i mean i think we've shown here uh, through our conversation you've got a myriad of photos and signatures and 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 and, and like not just like a i met you i'm taking a, a photo with you but like hands on like really live action photos and working with him and that just shows you like how uh, amazing of experience one of the kind of experience that must have been oh you know the 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 year that he left basketball and went to the birmingham barons to play baseball double a yeah yeah we went down there he couldn't hit a curveball that was his problem <laughs> we went down there because we were working on a game with him he called me over he gave me uh code numbers for his his private uh golf club health club in birmingham that i could use the whole duration and uh, he was awesome. I mean, these these guys loved working with EA and electronics, and it was always it was always fun. Oh, here's a here's a good one. So the first time I had I had called Jordan, I had called David Falk, uh, and like I said, back in those days, I would get so nervous before I'd call these guys because I'm like, oh, geez. and uh, I'd sit there for a few minutes, like like I was in high school. Uh, getting up the nerve to call my first date. And, um, you know, I'm re ready to call David Falk. So I finally get him. He agrees to come out. So uh, he's coming out to visit EA, and I was hope hopeful to sign the deal. It happened to be Halloween, okay? So at that time, EA was in uh, Foster City, and we were, like, on the third floor of an office building. And the first two floors were, like, on a bank or finance or something. So I'm all nervous. I I, I run down the stairs to greet Falk and his entourage, not Jordan. It was the business guys uh, at the front door to walk him in, to walk him in, to go up the elevator to EA. And so as I am getting in the elevator with these guys, I said, Hey, I just want you to know it's Halloween. And around here, that's like a sacred holiday, just in case, you know, so we get in, we go up to the third floor, the door opens, and here's David Falk in this like impeccable business suit. And um, the door opens, and he's like, a battery, a werewolf, a Superman. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, no. And they're like, ah! And so we walk in, we walk into oh. the, uh, to the conference room, and I sit down with him, and I go, hey, sorry, I told you it's Halloween. He goes, no, no, no. It's California. That we wanted to see that. That's awesome. So, you know, 
the thing that I was scared about, they're like all oh, these crazy Californians in Silicon Valley and Halloween. We've heard we've heard it's we've heard it's like that. So that was pretty funny. Well, well, a, a amazing anecdote. And I, and I really think, you know, we've teased it now. We've seen it on the screen a few times. You've made reference to it. You've talked about EA, EASN. And, and I think for yeah. our listeners, we need a little backstory on what that is and how that really kind of maybe was the precursor to what we know as EA Sports today, right? Yeah, so a lot, I, I think a lot of people don't know the real story of the, the real origin story of EA Sports. Uh, you know, I don't know. It's probably true of any big company. There's a tendency in my mind to kind of downplay or almost whitewash origin stories or individual stories. And it's kind of like, guess what? EA Sports didn't always just exist as this marketing juggernaut. You know, it started somewhere. Uh, I like to compare it to kind of like a skunk works. Uh, when, when EA Sports first started, it was just a skunk works. Luckily, there was, you know, me from production and a marketing guy and, a, and an art designer, and we were all on the same page with it. But what, what was going on at the time, like I said, you know, the company started with Dr. G and Bird. So sports was always in its DNA. Tripp was a big sports guy, Stratomatic baseball. We all played those games, you know, any kind of football game. I, I used to own a, an Atari uh, X and O's football, the big one with the giant track ball that would be a workout <laughs> just to get it going. Uh, so there was a lot of different people around that were doing sports. You know, there was Madden, there was Weaver, uh, people were talking to the PGA. Someone else was talking to the NFL. Someone was talking to NHL. Uh, I wanted to talk to the to the uh, NBA. You know, we had individual guys, all this stuff. And uh, as I was moving over to um, production from marketing, one of the last things I did was write a, uh, a a straw man or a white paper to the then head of marketing, Bing Gordon. And I entitled it Sports Legends. And in this document, I proposed that we pull all the sports uh, stuff together under, under a separate banner. The Legends idea was that, you know, we signed Madden for the NFL, Weaver for MLB. You know, if we were going to do Jordan with the NBA, you know, every uh, league seemed to have a legend uh, associated with it. Even so much that... Uh, we started talking with some guys about doing a driving simulator. Uh, I was helping another producer kind of shore that up. So I actually called Ferrari and got ended up getting a Ferrari license. And I thought, hey, even Ferrari is a legend of sport. Wow. Some in marketing, still driving games are weird. Is it a sport? Is it a driving game? You know, there was some argument. But to me... To if, me, you ask our, if you ask our co-host Bruno, he'll tell you it's a sport. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah. quick aside. So, uh, yeah, well, later pa on passionate... Passionate yeah. driving and F1 fans. So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we got the Ferrari thing. So we had all these cool licenses. And uh, I just felt like putting them all under a banner was the right thing to do. Luckily, Bing, who was the head of marketing, is a super bright guy. One of the smartest guys I've ever been around. He liked the idea a lot. And he gave us a lot of support, which was important. So around this time, uh, as I moved over to production and started working on stuff, um, I kept thinking about the sports legends idea. Uh, there were some in marketing who felt that EA itself wasn't even very well known. So it was too early to carve out a separate brand when EA wasn't known well enough yet on its own. And that actually made some sense. Uh, but I didn't let it deter me because I just thought, you know, it was too obvious to me and a few other people that this sports stuff had to be in its own brand. You know, and I read uh, there was some I read some interview with Elon Musk uh, a couple months ago, and he was talking about how sometimes in a company uh, on a certain decision, there's like 10 percent of the guys that know the right thing to do. And 90 percent don't doesn't matter. You just do what the 10 percent want to do. And uh, that was kind of how how this felt, you know, I wanted to do it. I talked to Don Transith who was in marketing and he was a great marketeer and he thought it was an awesome idea. So that was validation. And then Michael Kasaka, who was an art director and game designer, he also loved the idea. So, you know, to me that was validation. So, well, well I had come up with this uh, 
sports legends idea, I always say it was the three of us that really created the early EASN because without each other's support, it just might not have happened. So it was kind of a, a, a serendipitous moment that the three of us just all working together really locked on to this idea uh, and we started working on it. There were a couple capstone moments, I would say, that I didn't used to talk a lot about because I, I I wasn't sure. Uh, but now I, I have no no problem talking about the history. <laughs> um, one was uh, I started really focusing in on these stats games. And you guys probably don't know how boring the computer world was before graphics. But, you know, we used to play text adventures. And there were sports products that were just done in scrolling text. So uh, brutally, painfully boring, but uh, <laughs> this this statistical this statistical category that I started looking at, uh, I thought was really cool. And um, the statistics in this package were really good. And it was a game uh, called Hoops by Jeff Sagarin. Okay, it was sold at computer stores in a in a plastic bag. There was a floppy disk and a and a like a self printed. Uh, information sheet and you would boot this thing up and you could pick your college team and had all the stats, all these deep stats. And then you just sit there and like watch outcomes scroll across like a ticker tape, right? That was the whole thing, but the stats were awesome. So I used to think, man, I got to call this guy. We got to license these stats packages and we'll add graphics. Like that was kind of a, a dumb marketing guy's idea. Uh, so I didn't think I called Sagarin a couple of times. And anyway, as we started developing, we just figured, well, we're going to do our own stats package. We don't need to license it. And it was probably simplified from what he was using anyway. Um, um, quick aside, though, I mean, you mentioned Sagarin. I mean, I think you see today how much metrics are a part of sports, right? I mean, you've got, especially in even college basketball, he still has his own college basketball rankings based off his metrics. Ken Pomeroy has one as well. Yeah. I mean, look look at how those have become such a mainstay in analytics of evaluating the performance and the quality of teams each season, right? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, who would have known? You know, he was just some little guy in 1985 doing these boring stats games. But he, yeah, I think he became the grand poobah of, like, picking the March Madness tournament now. So that's, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So, yeah, just to see how that's that's transcended time as well with with the and how and how those metrics are now built into the video games, right? I mean, we talk about like you know trending on you know we see different things on social media and TikTok of turning you know building your own team and turning the stats to ninety nine and can you go eighty two and zero or can you go sixteen or seventeen and zero? Like there's oh, yeah. so much now customization with these metrics that it really adds a new element to games. Yeah, and you know where where it really goes nuts too is in some of the. Uh, uh, some of the European soccer stuff and the soccer managers and thief and all that stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty huge. So, uh, so that was one piece I was looking at. Another piece uh, that was really pretty important was uh, CinemaWare's uh, Amiga stuff. So I don't know if you guys ever saw any CinemaWare screenshots, but they were awesome on the Amiga. Their games are never that good, but their graphics were stellar. And they came out with two games on the Amiga called TV Sports Football and TV Sports Baseball. And I looked at those things. I was like, man, it looked awesome. Uh, They had studio set. They had things going on uh, that made it look like a television broadcast. The games were just terrible. Well, (laughs) they were no fun. Let's say that. They just didn't play. So I brought these Amigas into – Michael Kosaka, and I said, man, look at this. I said, we could do this, uh, and our games are good. And Cox, I was like, yeah, let me, uh, let me work on this. So, you know, it was only a couple of days later I came back, and Kosaka had this whole uh, layout, EASN, um, studio. He had announcers. You know, we did a little uh, – we were still – at halftime, we just scrolled random scores as if other games were going on, just – because it looked cool. The the third and the triumvirate of inspiration was ESPN. Because you guys don't realize ESPN at that time hadn't been around all that long. 
So we were enamored with the ES. There was nothing like it. You didn't have social media to get sports scores instantaneously. You had to wait. You know, the NBA playoffs, they they came on tape delay at midnight and you weren't covered in the paper. So when he when ESPN hit the airways, it was like, God, they had Sports Center on like, you know, a couple times a night and you could see score. And it was like revolutionary. We were addicted to ESPN. So like in those old days, we would do homages to things like ESPN and not even worry about it because we were such small potatoes that nobody saw it anyway. So it didn't matter. As we developed, like Skate or Die, we had Rodney Dangerfield character. You know, nowadays, if you tried to put that out with a character with Rodney Dangerfield, you'd get sued. But we we weren't worried about it because it was different time and different numbers and not not that many eyeballs. So he made this EASN layout look very similar to uh, ESPN uh, in the original iteration. Uh, and, and we even did caricatures of their announcers. So, uh, and, and like I said, we were just paying homage, not thinking that it was, you know, trying to do any harm. Don, oh, so yeah. is, that where the, is that where the EASN... Uh, acronym kind of stem from them is yeah, that like yeah. as an homage to ESPN yeah it was just our version of ESPN and we were like man someday we'd like to be the ESPN of video games so let's do it like ESPN okay the logo that you see there on screen that had already been reworked by Tran- Tranny and his marketing team they made it a little sleeker not quite so ESPN but it still looks like ESPN so none of us were really thinking that we were doing anything uh, egregious with it. Uh, the first game came out, uh, Lakers versus Celtics, and we had EASN on the court. You know, when you ran by, you might see it, and I think we had it in halftime, but we didn't have it on the packaging or anything yet. Um, that took that took a few iterations. So when, when, it, when Lakers first came out, people really liked it. They thought it was cool. We got a lot of feedback that it was good, so we started – doing more of it. And, um, you know, then the other trick was uh, the other big sports producer at the time, besides me, was Rich Hillman. He had some awesome stuff going on. He had, he had the Genesis and uh, better versions of Madden starting to go. He was, he was a big hockey guy. So he was doing NHL stuff. And we thought me and uh, Michael and Transit thought we got to get rich to get on board with this EASN idea. I was talking to Rich and at EA, uh, it wasn't like Atari where everybody kind of cooperated. At EA, the production teams were pretty competitive with each other. In fact, it was could could be pretty cutthroat at times. So it wasn't likely that one producer could walk over to another and give them a bunch of code and say, hey, could you put this in your game? They'd be like, what? This has uh, got uh, data leaks in it or something. So uh it was it was a little bit more of a difficult conversation for me to have, even though we had this kind of template stuff and this idea that we thought uh, we wanted uniform uniformity and controls and you know certain things so the sports brand had a consistency. He was kind of suspicious of my intentions, and uh, that's where Transit really came in strong because he was kind of a neutral marketing guy and could go, hey, you know marketing really likes this brand idea. Let's, let's do it. So then, you know, Rich got on board and it was really, he and I uh, at that point had ended up with most of the sports stuff. And uh, so, you know, kind of the, the early evolution was it went uh, EASN was in the game, got good feedback. We started putting EASN on the cover and in um, advertising as we started doing our EA's first generation of fourth generation consoles. So our first go around of cartridges on the Genesis and the SNES, we had, you know, just like we had been doing with the computer, we had EASN on the cover, no biggie, but boom, the difference in the cartridge market and the computer market. Now we had a lot more eyeballs. And now EASN was all of a sudden getting a lot of coverage. So uh, it went beyond, uh, you know, anything we really thought at the time. And ESPN then finally saw it and they weren't happy. They thought 
it was a, a trademark infringement. They thought we were, uh, you know, they were claiming we were ripping them off, right? And we're just a bunch of geeks in uh, Silicon Valley thinking, oh, we're no, we're paying homage. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, 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 Don, then, so what we're showing here is the premier issue of EASN magazine. Yeah. Are we to believe that this was the only uh, issue of ESN magazine. Well, I'm pretty sure it, it was the first. It was the first and last because it came out when we had our shit together at EASN, and we're getting a lot of visibility. I mean, enough for us to do a newsletter. You know, it had to be doing pretty well. The reason it was the last edition is because between that printing and whenever the next one was going to come out, ESPN came knocking. Uh, threatening lawsuits. And I remember hiding in my cube under the desk, like it was a, <laughs> a nuclear strike. I was like, oh shit. And like I told you guys, I was planning on my uh, next career as a fisherman in Alaska because I was worried that, uh oh, this time we really went too far. Uh, they were upset. They had a whole team of lawyers fly out. We really had. I mean, Ruth ha- Ruth Kennedy was our attorney, and she was awesome, a real bulldog. And she had probably some assistants working with her, but it was pretty much her against the ESPN attorneys. And uh, I remember my boss, Stuart Bond, head of production, was also dragged into these things. And they didn't want me, uh, you know, they, didn't, they wanted to keep us out of the loop and not be worried and all this stuff. So we had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. I just know we were like chewing our fingernails and losing sleep and pretty, uh, pretty worried about everything. So finally uh, at the end of the week, it all got resolved and Ruth came out to go talk to me and I'm like, ah, shit, here goes. I'm getting my walking papers. And uh, she goes, well, uh, EASN, We've got to we've got to say goodbye to ESN. It's no more. And I'm like, ah. She goes, but they've agreed to let us sell the pro- remaining products on the shelf, which was a threat of theirs. We're going to make you pull everything off the shelf. Which uh, I'm no kidding. That probably would have put us under. You know, we just back in those days, it was like that was a horrible thought if you would have had to had to pull everything off the shelf. And um, she said. They'll let us keep selling inventory if we change our name. And uh, the other thing they'll do, they're going to give us free television ad time. So uh, wow. let's change their name. And I'm like, fine. You got a deal. And uh, yeah. And <laughs> well, so Don Trans's group, I don't know if they already had been thinking about it. It didn't take him very long to come up with EA Sports. And um he was working with these great marketeers at Shiat Day who came up with the uh, EA Sports It's in the Game tagline. So uh, even though EASN was no longer, it wasn't very painful, and we hit the ground running with EA Sports pretty quickly. And I remember watching that first Madden EA Sports ad, and it was pretty cool. I think it's probably online. Uh, and I don't remember if it was on a Monday night game or when it was, but I remember we were all watching and we couldn't believe it because really at that time, there still wasn't a lot of video game advertising going on, especially on television. So uh, I don't, you know, without that, without that lawsuit and the resolution, I don't think we ever would have uh, at least at that time afforded television ads. And really that Madden TV ad really launched the brand in a much bigger way than could it could have ever been done. So, you know, it's one of these stories where it's lemons turned to lemonade for sure, because uh, without going through that, I don't think EA Sports would have existed. But so that's the story. EASN was the point works that grew into EA Sports. And like I say, if it wasn't for us three geeks sitting around in a cube looking at Amiga Cineware stuff, might never have happened. Well, there you go. You wouldn't have a picture like this. Say, yeah, I was just <laughs> saying, that's amazing. Can I just say that is an amazing story? And to, to hear about uh, how that turned into an a amazing deal, right? I mean, that could have gone totally wrong and, and to just be a simple name change and free marketing for EA Sports. And I mean, wow, that that's, that's incredible. I, I have one quick question before we wrap up here. Yeah. You talked about the 
the the the moniker the slogan it's in the game i mean i just as a nostalgia thing for me as a kid i mean that you hear that hook right as the game loads and you're like oh man like my adrenaline kicks up i'm ready to play it was that always something you guys wanted to build into that or what was kind of the the genesis of of having that be the 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 slogan two guys from shy at day uh came up with that slogan and that that whole uh that whole campaign and all that EA sports that's in the game that came from the creative marketing process uh after the uh after the lawsuit so uh no that was that was their that was their thing i mean and when we heard it it was perfect because that's always what we intended you know that right. like i was talking about earlier uh when we were building jordan and bird into the game that that was our intention and uh so to me it meant yeah we're not just licensing these people we're actually you know when when we did john madden football it, it had the uh, designers and john madden as designer you know we list on jordan bird uh jordan and bird were were credited as designers which they also dug you know all the athletes love that too so that really uh epitomized what we are trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Set the bar now for the last, what, you know, 30, almost 30 years or 20, 30 years of EA sports. So, well, well, thank you, Don. This has been an absolute pleasure to be able to sit down with you here to talk about the origin story of EA sports, really hear about some of your beginnings in your career at Atari and how that led to getting to EA and, and, and really, like you said, kind of, uh, your your story in bringing EA Sports to life and and to, for the betterment of the gaming industry and personally my childhood. So uh, yeah. I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today to to talk to us about that. And uh, yeah, I'm just thank thank you so much, Nick. Do you wanna you wanna wrap it up for us? I mean, and just one chapter of your life, right? And that's kind of the the great thing about this is you know we're gonna be talking more about your your later years uh, in in future episodes and and just kind of what your insights and what you've learned from just your in, incredible contributions to the gaming industry. Um, I, I could go on for for quite a bit about just the, all the incredible games that you've had a part of that that meant something to me, even some of the the wackier ones like Shaq Fu. We're gonna have to talk yeah. about Shaq Fu at some oh, point, yeah. Don. Yeah, <laughs> never never talked about before, but. I, I, I can, there's some funny stuff about that. Definitely. Well, we'll have to, we'll tease it. We'll tease our listeners. We've got more to come with Don here in the future and other future QTB legends. So, uh, you know, I'll kick it over to you, Nick, for, to wrap it up here for us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for checking this out. We have the, uh, the, the, this is available on our regular QTB feed, whether you're watching or listening and yeah, stay tuned for more with Don on future episodes and we will see you next time on QTB legends. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks.